This podcast is about correcting the balance, whether it's something celebrated as good when it shouldn't be or the other way around. Or maybe the heroic tales of history just need to be knocked straight on their ass. Me, I just want to share the complete picture because that's when this whole thing gets fun. Warning, jokes and sarcasm may ensue. Welcome to Prick the Balloon. Hi, welcome to Prick the Balloon. I'm Mike Vance. The state government of Texas has been 100% controlled by Republicans for almost 30 years. The last time a Democrat was elected to statewide office was in 1994. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey had not even started elementary school, though rumor was they were already doing it. So when Ken Paxton, the Texas Attorney General, a not much of a man who has won elections twice while under active indictment, was impeached by the Texas House to face charges in the Texas Senate, you can rest assured that it was full frontal, lurid Republican on Republican action. Boom, chicky, boom, boom. Wow. But presiding over the trial in the state Senate was a failed TV sportscaster with an IQ south of six and an ethics quotient even lower. So how do you assure your darling radical right-wing maybe crook in the AG's office is not convicted and removed on 16, step right up and count them, 16 alleged criminal counts? Well, bribery. Yeehaw! It's the time-tested Texas way. Therefore, a pro-Paxton group that includes several deep-pocketed white Christian nationalists handed the judge who would preside over the Texas Senate, that being the lieutenant governor, $3 million in cash. Not under the table, but right out in the goddamned open. Three million dollars given to light gov Dan Patrick, which is not even his real name, by the way. And what did Patrick do for his money? Made a few phone calls to wavering votes, fixed the trial rules to make conviction much harder, and badmouthed the Texas House 24-7, including alleging at one point that the House Speaker was presiding while drunk. I use the word wavering because several of the fellow traveler cowardly righties voted to dismiss the charges sent from the Republican-dominated House before they even heard them. Well, shit, Jimmy Ray. He says he's with Jesus, even though he has been slap-banging that girl who was sleeping with that councilman from San Antonio. But if he's with the Lord, then what do we care who pays to get his house remodeled? Lot to unpack there? Well, yeah. Let me explain. Paxton was supposedly having a very well-known affair with a four-time divorced 50-year-old woman who at the same time was the girlfriend of a San Antonio city councilman who was indicted on drunk driving hit-and-run charges right after he told the teenage cashier to drive through restaurant, I love you. But that ain't the half of it. Paxton's wife just happens to be one of the 31 state senators who was supposed to pass judgment on him. Initially, she insisted on not recusing herself, but eventually she changed her mind. Whereupon the recently greased judge in the matter said, fine, she's exempted from taking part, but she still counts toward the total number of votes needed. It's like needing the votes of jurors who were never even seated. And house remodeled, you say? Yep. Among the impeachment counts was that Paxton pressured his office to ignore a slew of alleged charges against an alleged criminal who allegedly paid to remodel Paxton's alleged house. Allegedly. Did I mention the woman supposedly hiding Paxton's hot dogs sometimes worked for this alleged dude? Or that most of Paxton's senior staff either resigned or were fired after going on the public record that he was being bribed and subsequently they had to file a whistleblower complaint? Or that even though the state Senate refused to convict him after only two Republican senators had the cojones and morality to vote against him, the FBI is still looking into all this. Meanwhile, Paxton still faces first-degree felony security fraud charges, and the prosecutor there said, quote, Unlike the impeachment, this is going to be a fair trial. This judge is not corrupt. This judge is not on the take. End quote. That trial has been delayed for more than eight years over what looked to me like stupid-ass motions by Paxton and his non-animated minions, including one involving the prosecutorial fee schedule that has meant prosecutors say that they haven't been paid for their work since 2016. That trial is set for April. And I'm not even going to mention that the governor has taken millions from a similar group of Christian nationalists who have met for hours, perhaps multiple times, with a dude who runs a white nationalist group and has praised Hitler, called for a war against Jews, and publicly fantasized about marrying a 16-year-old girl. 
In return for that money, the governor has relentlessly pushed and threatened to pass school vouchers that take tax money from public schools and give them to private schools without any accountability. Schools run by the church. Like, that's never been an episode of Law & Order. Apologies that there seem to be fewer jokes in those opening minutes, but nobody alive can write shit any funnier than what these pearl clutch and born-again baboons have actually done. So, I'm going to go out on a limb right now and name Texas as the current reigning champion of state political corruption. But this is a history podcast. So, I wanted to know which of our fine American states deserves the historic title. Who should wear the scarlet belt as the most politically corrupt state of all time? Let's get ready to line our pockets. If you simply Google most corrupt state, you're likely to get a study for which some academic pinheads presumably got paid that says, by their metric, Vermont is the most corrupt state in the nation. Even though they're not talking about politics, it's Vermont. Are they passing envelopes of hot syrup behind the spring house? Of course not. So let's get real. When I first thought of this topic, a trio of various obvious candidates sprang to mind. Illinois, New York, and the aforementioned Texas. Surely there are dark horses and never forget Villanova in 1985. Anything can happen. Are there rules for this determination? Hell no. It's corruption we're talking about. But I will try to keep things mostly in-state and leave national politics out of it. Are there style points? Oh, you bet you're flying Walinda's sphincter there are style points. There will be questions, such as, we're over five minutes in and you still haven't mentioned Florida. Well, while mud-wrestling grudge sex with an alligator on ecstasy is world-class dumbass, it's not corrupt by definition until Ron DeSantis or Jeb Bush do it. And I'm not saying they didn't. Though, special props for leaving the dead body of the election supervisor in the governor's hallway. We're also going to have to do a little reading between the lines. The Center for Illinois Politics created a handy-dandy little list of indicted governors that shows 11 sitting governors indicted on federal fraud charges. Not too surprisingly, three of those 11 were governors of Illinois including a very tough to pull off back-to-back -back twisting double sow cow of deceit. Louisiana managed to lose two governors to the feds, and we will most assuredly be spending more time with one of those. The states who've only managed to win the Shady Cup once are Tennessee, North Dakota, Alabama, Oklahoma, Connecticut, and West Virginia. For the record, that's seven Democrats and four Republicans. But I promise that as you'll plainly see, criminal activity is a very bipartisan issue. One of those Illinois guys was the very boyish-looking Rod Blagojevich, which is the most Jerry Lewis-sounding name in gubernatorial history. Blagojevich with the lady! <laughs> he tried to auction off Barack Obama's old Senate seat. It was only driven on Sundays after basketball. Blagojevich followed George Ryan, who was indicted twice as Secretary of State and still got elected governor before getting sentenced to six years in the aptly named Pokey. The previous governor who went to prison got dropped in the shed over illegal payments at the horse track. They've also had four U.S. House members convicted of various crimes in my lifetime, and their state House Speaker just had to resign. But you gotta hand it to Northern Illinois. They're now the only federal district in the country with three offices investigating potential fraud. It's like a drive through No lines, no waiting. Could I interest you in an Apple turnover while you rat out your co-conspirators? If you're a glass-half-full kind of person, well, Illinois now had three consecutive governors who have not been sent to federal prison. Honorable mention to three governors on that list. John Rowland of Connecticut, whose wife wrote a parody of a visit from St. Nicholas, excoriating investigators for looking into her husband. The bribes were all laundered and hidden with care. There was William Langer of North Dakota, who required all state employees to buy a subscription to the newspaper he owned. And I especially like Ray Blanton of Tennessee, who was selling liquor licenses for a 30% kickback. Since it's Tennessee, by all rights, he should have had moonshiners racing the profits around Nashville in a souped-up Chevy Bel Air with Old Crow written on the side. There have been 17 other governors who were convicted of state crimes or lesser criminal charges. Shout out there to Illinois, Alabama, Oklahoma, and West Virginia for making this list, too, with Illinois and Alabama managing to put another two names on the tote board. 
Now, I don't want to leave anybody out. So the others are North Carolina, twice, Arizona, twice, plus Missouri, Arkansas, South Dakota, Indiana, Maryland, Ohio, and Rhode Island. To be fair, one of the North Carolina governors was removed from office because he had the unmitigated temerity to actively go after the Klan for lynching people. The nerve. One thing about this list is that only two people are from the 19th century. And since that's the century that gave us Boss Tweed and quite literally coined the word shoddy to talk about corrupt military contractors, I know that's a load of moose shit. Several other governors were impeached, convicted, removed from office, but missed out on time in the Hooskow. The very first governor Nebraska ever had got tossed for stealing government money. Jim Ferguson in Texas, and remember that name, Old Jim wanted my alma mater to fire a bunch of professors. When they didn't, he vetoed all of the university's appropriation. It cost him his job and barred him from office forever, as it should be. John Walton in Oklahoma cracked down on the Klan after the Tulsa massacre in 1921, and the legislator booted him from office for, among other things, misusing the military. Henry Johnston in Oklahoma got impeached twice for incompetence, including a charge that his secretary had too much influence over his decisions. The secretary and her knee pads had no comment. But um pum So far, Illinois, Alabama, and Oklahoma seem to have separated themselves from the pack. Alabama had two indicted governors I haven't even mentioned. As I said before, I don't give the proverbial rat's ass what you do in your boudoir, but don't be a hypocrite about it. Robert Bentley was one of those God and country guys until he got caught having a torrid affair with his chief political advisor. He was caught on tape talking about putting his hands on her breasts, a word that sent every church lady in Montgomery into a moist little tizzy. He is a board-certified dermatologist, so perhaps she was just bent over the desk while he examined her for a rash. Bentley, of course, lied about all of it, and apparently tried to send one of his security detail guys to break up with the woman. Governor says, hey, and he needs his toothbrush back. Perhaps the best little Bama twist on this one is that the guy who filed the impeachment charges against Bentley was later convicted for trying to defraud Medicare. The other recent Alabama governor resignation was Guy Hunt, and his story is kind of beautiful. In addition to being a career politician, he was also a preacher in the, I am not making this up, primitive Baptist church. Yep, as opposed to the other kind. Well, he got caught for using the state jet to take him to preaching gigs, where he got paid with, quote, love offerings. And yes, I am totally surprised Robert Bentley never used that term. Anyway, prosecutors let Hunt slide because, you know, Alabama. But then Hunt got indicted and convicted because he took 200 large out of the state inauguration account and bought new lawnmowers and had his shower marbled. Simple man, simple goals. He had to give the money back, he got five years probation, and a thousand hours of community service. Presumably mowing some shit. In addition to its other points, we can't let Oklahoma slide by without mentioning that one of the hottest movies in America right now is about defrauding the Osage Indians in Oklahoma to get their oil lands, and, oh yeah, murdering a hundred or more of them in the process. And why should we be surprised at any of this when the state's freaking motto is all about the Sooners, who are the folks who cheated in the state land giveaway? And though this has nothing to do with sports, I gotta drop OU in the grease as the university who broke into their rival stadium to videotape practices. Luckily, you can still mail your money in to keep Oral Roberts from dying again. Now, Every city in America has had its share of local aldermen and city councilmen taking what George Washington Plunkett of Tammany Hall called good old honest graft. Some cities, however, have been overachievers. It's a long list, but Frank Haig of Jersey City was one of the guys who retired a multimillionaire on a $2 salary. I single him out because for a small state, New Jersey has a couple of doozies. There was Abscam, which snagged a U.S. senator, a congressman, and the mayor of Camden with a fake Arab sheik that got made into the movie American Hustle. You know you're in trouble when your name crosses the desk of a casting director. There was Governor Jim McGreevy, who got smacked with a sexual harassment suit by a security advisor and then had a coming-out press conference that led to a nasty divorce and several tell-all books. 
There was Bridgegate and Chris Christie in a Speedo. And then there was Bid Rig, a total of 44 corruption indictments that netted three New Jersey mayors, two state legislators, 20 candidates for public office, five Orthodox rabbis, and one lunatic offering to sell a human kidney. They were either laundering money or selling building permits for future shithole properties, which in New Jersey may or may not be redundant. I opened with modern Texas, but there is some good historical material too, going back to the Reconstruction governor who may or may not have lost the election to corrupt ex-Confederates, but in any event barricaded himself in his Capitol office and refused to leave. It's the state that gave us the TV show Dallas, which was the first hit nighttime soap opera about backstabbing and double dealing. Or the football team Dallas, who gave us a whole roster of drug dealers and a secret team house about which their all-pro guard said, Can y'all leave us alone? We're just trying to run a few whores through here. Jim Ferguson, that Texas governor who got impeached, well, his wife got elected since he couldn't run, and the pair of them pardoned 3,000-some state prisoners in return for a little something-something from their families. More than two dozen Texas state officials were either indicted or resigned in the 1970s over gifts of bank stock in order to rewrite banking legislation in return. That included a governor who got the good old unindicted co-conspirator label, then there was the $74 billion fraud that was Enron, and a state House speaker who had to resign because he got caught trying to sell press credentials to a bunch of far-right lobbyists in return for them targeting 10 members of his own party in their re-election bids. Finally, there were the giant campaign contributions from the oil and gas industry that sent millions of dollars into the pocket of that same governor I mentioned at the outset in return for appointing a passel of stooges to state regulatory boards. And that, in turn, led to 11 million Texans going days without power or water when the temperature dropped below freezing for four straight days in February 2021. And because of the open cesspool of graft and bribery we euphemistically call campaign contributions, thousands of consumers got electric bills for as much as a grand a day, while the slime-sucking governor ordered wholesale prices to stay high, literally bankrupting at least one local electric co-op. People were billed and had to pay for electricity that they didn't even get. Oh yeah, and 246 people died due to the freeze with no reliable power. But, on the other hand, the governor's donors made millions, so it's all good. How did these people get elected in Texas? Well, you can go back to the first time Lyndon Johnson ran for Senate as a good example. He got the endorsement of Franklin Roosevelt in a crowded field of 11 candidates. And the day after the election, he had a decent little lead. Then over the following weeks, quote, corrected returns, end quote, started trickling in from 17 counties in East Texas. Returns manipulated by that same ex-governor Jim Ferguson from the 1910s and 20s. Miraculously, Lyndon lost the election by a thousand votes that showed up a couple of weeks after the polls closed. The only difference from the big thing you're thinking of is that Pappy O'Daniel, the guy who beat Lyndon, never dyed himself orange and was never stupid enough to get caught paying off the hookers he ordered. As for Lyndon, he vowed to never get caught like that again. The next time he ran for Senate to take the seat of the man who had beaten him seven years earlier but proved himself too stupid to tie his own shoe, it was Lyndon who produced the late miracle boxes with votes cast from the cemetery. The wisdom in Texas election is keep a few cards in your vest pocket till after the other guys quit counting. I mentioned Tammany Hall a time or two, and that really was the American standard for corruption possibly because, as always, history is written by New Yorkers, but also because it started the same year as our Constitution, and it was truly the first big American political racket. The original point of Tammany society was to stop the Federalists of Alexander Hamilton at all costs. It started with the backing of some of the wealthiest families in Manhattan, but by the Civil War, Tammany was a corrupt machine. It dispensed favors to the Irish immigrants fleeing the potato famine in return for reliable votes. These weren't so much the politicians as the people who controlled the politicians and chose who would hold what office. Tammany controlled politics in Manhattan and was run by people with names like Fat Charlie or Big Tim. 
You remember the great movie Gangs of New York? Literally street gangs, and several of them controlled specific wards for Tammany Hall. The Dead Rabbits, Plug Uglies, Bowery Boys, those were both real political gangs and evidence that Dick Cheney was born a century too late. Tammany politicians started collecting bribes from people who wanted riverboat or ferry operations, all kinds of licenses, and they mysteriously started getting parcels of real estate that had formerly belonged to the city or were just about to be developed. They even had a scheme with the city council called the 40 Thieves where a law or ordinance would be written up that would do very specific harm to a certain person's business interests. That person would get all panty-wadded and complain to council, whereupon they'd be told that it was a mistake and it could all go away for a fee. It was a government protection racket, and it's still how certain elements of government are run today. Polly, they took my thumbs! Boss Tweed really upped the Tammany game. By selling city jobs, running and staffing every agency, he got his hand into the city cash and public works. If you bought an egg cream in Manhattan, Boss Tweed and his friends got a cut. He was eventually brought down by journalists at the New York Times, once again underscoring why you need to support the great newspapers through subscriptions. Tammany survived, although weakened and more Irish than ever. It stuck around long enough to launch the careers of people like Al Smith and Franklin Roosevelt. But did it ever really go away? People did at least start fighting back. The last three governors in New York, before the current one, have left office in disgrace. Or at least in a bathrobe, black socks, and sandals. As New York's current governor was set to take office, the Washington Post pointed out that 16 people had filled the top four posts in New York state government since 2006, and nine of them left amid scandal. That's more than half. Prior to the present two-year calm, they also lost a former state assembly speaker and three congressmen, one of whom was guilty of insider trading and lying about it, and who was then, of course, pardoned by Trump, who was currently on trial for kind of similar stuff. Throw in the famous Anthony Weiner's Weiner, and you find a theme in New York. We all know the story of Andrew Cuomo, who was accused of inappropriate comments and unwanted touching by roughly 216 women, give or take. And did the old, that never happened. Well, maybe a little bit, but I'm sorry if they took it wrong when I asked if they were turned on by Grandpa Plonker. There was the New York Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, who was apparently slapping various women during sex and making them call him master. And then there's the case of client number nine, number nine, of the Emperor's Club VIP escort service, who turned out to be Governor Elliot Spitzer, who was plopping down five grand a pop for super high-class hookers with high heels, diamonds, and armpits that smelled like the backseat of a Bentley. All that did was inspire an entire TV series called The Good Wife, And you can only come away with two conclusions here. New Yorkers are into some weird shit, and they're getting a lot of it. Well, as good as the case may be for New York, and Illinois, and Alabama, and Texas, and even Oklahoma and New Jersey, I've got to ultimately cast my vote for the state with what I believe to be the most colorful corruption among the 50. Now, I have to admit, Illinois really prides itself on the corruption in Chicago. I read 20 versions of news stories saying that statistically, Chicago was the most corrupt city and Illinois was the third most corrupt state. But none of the damn articles said who was ahead of them. Finally, I found the full study. And do you know who was ahead of them? D.C., which I hate to inform the Illinois school system, is still not a damn state. And my front runner, Louisiana. But this is not about stats. It's about my completely unreasonable and subjective opinion. An old Louisiana congressman named Billy Tozan always said, half this state is underwater and the other half is under indictment. I personally have driven on Louisiana roads that alternated pavement every half mile because two different construction firms had bribed the parish commissioners. Just in the last 20 years, you got in Louisiana mayors and sheriffs and parish officials going to jail for kickbacks involving algebra software, golf courses, bail bonds, their girlfriend's car, parish jail buildings, and Popeye's chicken. They had a coroner indicted for stealing money. A coroner, for Christ's sake. 
That's right, Louisiana nabbed fucking Quincy. If you go back in the history of the state, which was the linchpin of the U.S. swindling Napoleon out of 828,000 square miles that now make up a quarter of our mainland, you find lots more to shake your head at. There are some hellaciously tasty stories. Huey Long is one of the most fascinating politicians the country has ever known. All the King's Men was loosely based on him. The book won the Pulitzer Prize, then the movie won three Oscars. They even remade the film in 2006. As the great philosopher Homer said, It's a good story because it's true. Or was it? Huey was called the Kingfish, and one of my favorite Randy Newman songs was written about him. He ran Louisiana during the Depression on what was the most successful socialist program America had ever seen. And the corporate entities all across America hated him more than they have ever hated anyone. Oil and gas interests despised him. Rich people, big companies, in short, everyone who had been lining their pockets under the big business robber baron system that had run the world for ages. If he hadn't been assassinated, Huey was eyeing the presidency. It was called Share the Wealth, and he had a catchy campaign song, Every Man a King, that included... There's enough for all people to share. He built roads, hospitals, bridges, levees, schools, and gave out free school books. He loved LSU and poured money into the university. He built a skyscraper state capitol building. In other words, he did what government should do, and the people of Louisiana loved and rewarded him for it. Thing is that Hugh and his cronies, well, they liked rewards too. So they kind of took a few lawn yops for themselves like to the alleged tune of millions in state money when a million dollars meant something. But here's the thing. There were lots of allegations, but nothing was ever proved against Huey. And it sure as shit wasn't for lack of trying either. His opponents tried to impeach him as governor and wrung their hands in the national press like church ladies in a nudist colony. After Huey died, seven of his protégés went to jail, including one governor and the president of LSU, who was apparently using state money at the horse track. But Huey himself was never found guilty of anything except using everything at his disposal, and then some, to consolidate total power. Elections were an adventure under Huey. Not only did his machine have their own vote counters and busloads of state employees brought in as campaign workers, Huey's boys even filed thousands of dummy candidates in these little local elections just to get names randomly drawn as election commissioners so that they would control every single precinct in Louisiana. And they did all this a century before AI. Geniuses, I tell you. When he got elected to the U.S. Senate in 1930 at the age of 37, Huey didn't want to give up running Louisiana, so he waited almost two years to show up. He also lined up the other Louisiana Senate seat for a buddy of his named John Overton. In addition to all the usual tricks, Huey's machine promised the families of almost everyone in state penitentiaries that their men would be set free if they voted for Overton. The guy who lost to Overton filed a Senate complaint, and then there was a huge investigation, backed by Franklin Roosevelt's forces, to get Long and Overton both tossed out of the Senate. Nothing stuck. Overton stayed there until 1948, and Long only left because his political opponents had him shot dead in Baton Rouge. Huey definitely warrants his own podcast someday. But while the motivations of those who say he was so corrupt are questionable their own selves, there is zero denying Huey and his family made good stories. The Long family was so gloriously colorful, sketchy, and well-liked that even his brother, Earl Long, got a movie made about him. Earl was played by Paul Newman, nailing honky-tonk strippers while drunk and wearing cowboy boots. All in all, the Long family was the real dynasty in Louisiana, and no, I don't give a flying shit about those duck idiots. The Long family produced two Louisiana governors, three U.S. senators, four U.S. House members, and a slew of state reps and other officials. Man, people in Louisiana are still naming their kids Huey to this day. David Vitter was one of those morality police Republicans, rabidly against any type of abortion or any type of same-sex marriage. He moved up from State House to U.S. House, and when he first ran for U.S. Senate in 2004, a fellow Republican accused him of having a long-running affair with a prostitute. 
I think technically the rest of us call that capitalism as opposed to an affair, but I'm not here to pick nits. He adamantly denied it, and he called it typical rank Louisiana politics. And if anyone did not see this coming, the whole thing came out in the D.C. Madam scandal. Vitter loved hookers for years. Evidently, he wasn't even picky like Elliot Spitzer. And when the whole thing broke, Vitter's there all teary-eyed, asking for forgiveness, and his wife stood steadfastly by his side, while her standing simultaneously fell among people having sex in the French Quarter and rose among other women not putting out at the country club. And being Louisiana, Vitter ran for Senate again and won. Y'all remember Ray Nagin for being the New Orleans governor who became famous during Katrina for standing up to George W. and telling the world how much his people were hurting and how much they were going to build back even the poor black neighborhoods while old W. was saying, heck of a job, Brownie. Well, old Ray was selling city contracts, apparently, and none too selective about it. The fall began with free trips to Hawaii, then truckloads of granite delivered to his son's business, and ended up being a half mill into Ray's bank accounts. After he gave that sum back, he claimed he was on the verge of taking food stamps. The feds were so nice about it that they absolutely insisted on him being housed and fed at their expense for the next six years at the Texarkana Correction Institute. William Jefferson is another Louisiana guy worthy of comment, if for no other reason that this overachiever set the all-time record for longest prison sentence ever handed out to a congressman. Now, he did get seven charges dropped on appeal and was sprung after just five years inside, but his record still stands. And I'll say this for William Jefferson. He had so many indictments that he managed to take his brother, his sister, and a niece down with him. Take that, you criminal slackers. Who dat? Finally, there is one of the most fun politicians to watch in all of American history. The Edwin Edwards campaign had bumper stickers that said, Vote for the Crook. That may be all you need to know, but humor me, will ya? Edwin grew up with an English-speaking father and French-speaking mother, and he ran for governor of Louisiana as a New Deal populist in the footsteps of Huey and Earl Long. He got the state a whole new constitution during his first term in office. Oil money was good, and things were sailing along. Edwin had incredible charisma. He was funny, he wore expensive clothes, but Edwin also loved to gamble and run around on his wife, uh, wives, and he didn't get two shits who knew about it. Early on, he got accused of selling state agency jobs and taking illegal campaign contribution. But Edwin's answer was, quote, it was illegal for them to give it, but not for me to accept it, end quote. He got in trouble for taking money from a Korean businessman, and he used the opportunity to badmouth the U.S. government for being all moralistic and shit. He had to sit out a term because he couldn't run for three in a row under state law, but then he was back. Soon after he came back, he had to stand trial for bribery, mail fraud, and obstruction of justice. But he was acquitted. Edwards, who did not drink, had a party at a French Quarter bar where he threw fake hundred-dollar bills in the air. His brother, also indicted, used to dress up like Mr. Moneybags from Monopoly. Edwin once rode a mule to the federal courthouse. He finally met his downfall in his fourth term as governor over close to a million bucks in payoffs for locating a for-profit prison in Louisiana. Ultimately, he got convicted on 17 counts of what the feds technically referred to as all kinds of crooked shit. He also managed to take the owner of the 49ers down with him. Edwin Edwards turned 80 years old in jail, where he also served as prison librarian and helped several inmates get their GEDs. When he got out, he said several more had filed and were pending, but that he, quote, honestly didn't feel like sticking around to see if they succeeded, end quote. I had a friend years ago who worked for a TV station in Savannah. She'd gotten her start working media for a Louisiana senator, and before that, she went to school at LSU. She had lots of great stories, including one about Jesse Helms getting lost trying to get in and out of his own Senate office building not once, but every damn day. Anyway, she told me that while Edwin was governor, he was having a fling with a young lady who lived in her sorority house. And several times a week, a fancy black car with license plates that said Louisiana won would pull up in front of the house, and this college girl in a jogging suit would hop out after her night in the governor's mansion. 
There's an old saw to the effect that Democrats have sex scandals and Republicans steal money. But Denny Hastert, Mark Foley, Roy Moore, and Matt Gates would beg to differ, just for a start. And on the other side of the aisle, Bob Menendez might be willing to buy you an expensive drink and be persuaded about the accuracy of that statement. Either way, it's plain to see that Fast Eddie Edwards was happy to enjoy both types of scandals. He was a true bilateral crook. One last Edwin story. When he won his third term as governor of Louisiana, he chartered two jumbo jets and took 618 of his closest friends and campaign supporters to Paris for a week. All it took was to give the governor a minimum of 10 grand. They chartered buses, gambled at Monte Carlo Casino, had a special mass at Notre Dame, and a big-ass seated dinner at Versailles, though without Dixie beer or sucking the heads on anything, at least in public. Edwards had a meeting with President Mitterrand and with the mayor of Paris, who at that time was Jacques Chirac. In true Edwin fashion, at one point he looked at Chirac and he said, Monsieur Mayor, parlez le bon français. You speak good French. Keep in mind that Louisiana achieved all of this while ranking 25th in population, packing in way more nefarious activity per capita. So Louisiana gets my vote. Shit, in Cajun spirit, I voted 16 times. But you don't have to agree. As the cliche kids say, your mileage may vary. I'll even double down, though, and say that the most ingrained corruption seems to be found on the western Gulf Coast, where people like Edwin Edwards, Ken Paxton, and David Vitter can get caught and keep winning re-election. Note that in New York, scandalized politicians resign, and in Illinois, they go to jail. Down in Louisiana and Texas, they just throw a big-ass crawfish boiler barbecue. Reservations not required. aye The important thing to take away from this little fun exercise is that corruption is every damn place. Alive and well in all 50-plus Puerto Rico and Guam. The United States is easily the most openly corrupt nation on Earth. No backroom penny ante graph for our politicians. We just call it campaign finance. And the fact that several of the stories I just shared are about folks who couldn't even steal enough that way is flat-ass sad. But until we take the money out of the system, not only will politicians keep getting rich on our cash, but none of our national needs will ever get taken care of. How's that for a cheery ending? Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out my website at MikeVanceWriter.com. Prick the Balloon is copyrighted by Mike Vance, all rights reserved.